everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure tonight and my honor to welcome uh, one of our weekly online international series of the Mega Medical Association. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Mahdi for this creative and prestigious continuous opportunity to deliver not only an up-to-date curriculum in the field of anesthesiology, critical care medicine and brain, but also to gather a unique speakers from uh, and moderators from all over the globe, which was a great and successful experience uh, in the current and the future virtual learning, especially during the current pandemic. Tonight, we have a special topic in the neuroanesthesia and the neurocritical care with unique names in the field. I would like to welcome Dr. Fawzia Khan and Dr. Sohail uh, Shamandi on the panelist side and Dr. Yasser Zaghloul and Dr. Uh, Masimu Lamberti on the speaker side. Uh, Dr. Fawzia Khan is a, a featured uh, uh, and tenured professor of anesthesiology at the Aga Khan University uh, in Karachi, Pakistan. She completed her anesthesia training from the UK uh, and uh, was one of the founding members of, members of the Department of Anesthesiology at Agassan University. She chaired the department uh, between 2002 and 2010. She has published more than 160 articles uh, in the peer-reviewed journals and received the Research Productivity Award of Pakistan Council of Science and Technology and mentioned in the directory of productive scientists of Pakistan. Her current clinical interests are pediatric and the neurosurgical anesthesia. She has been actively involved in education and the training of residents in Pakistan and is an examiner uh, uh, for the fellowship uh, in anesthesia, College of Physicians and Surgeons uh, of Pakistan. She chaired the safety uh, and the quality practice committee of the World Federation of the Societies of uh, Anesthesia, WFCA, from 2016-2020, to and is continuing as a member of the, com uh, of the committees in its present tenure. She's an editor uh, uh, of the Anesthesia Practice Newsletter and senior editor of Anesthesia, Pain and Intensive Care Journal. We have also uh, on board Dr. Suhail uh, Shamandi. In the, uh, he is the current head of anesthesia department and surgical ICU and Bain in CHU, uh, CHU Notre Dame de, de Sivers Chopel. Dr. Shamandi is an assistant professor at Holly Spirit University, USEK, and Lebanese University. He had a liver transplant anesthesia fellowship from Pittsburgh University, USA and also a fellowship in Bain Northampton General Hospital. Dr. Shamandi is an accomplished affiliate to the Arab board and is the president of the Lebanese Society of Anesthesia. President Dr. Yasser Zahloun is a consultant of anesthesia, Chair Khalifa Medical City Abu Dhabi, UAE, director of Abu Dhabi Anesthesia Club, lecturer and inspector of many international anesthesia, and ICU courses. Previous post consultant of anesthesia and ICU in Iran, graduated in 1986 from Faculty of Medicine, Alexandria University, Egypt, with a fellowship in anesthesia college of anesthetists, Iran. He has extensive experience and interest in neuroanesthesia and neurocritical care, neonatal and pediatric anesthesia and perioperative medicine. Dr. Zahloun delivered more than 200 lectures in international anesthesia, pain, and ICU conferences. Dr. Zahloun, the platform is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Sohail. And I am so happy today to present this talk, Traumatic Brain Injury in Pediatric Patients. Uh, the overview of this lecture's introduction, children versus adults, of course, anytime you are talking about the pediatric patient, in some situation we have to compare with the adults. Pathophysiology of acute brain injury, either primary or secondary, Brain Trauma Foundation Guidelines for the Pediatric, not for adults. Adults was published in 2016, but this one published 2019. 
perioperative management, if you have a patient, pediatric patient with head trauma, what we should do, and then conclusion. Of course, when we are talking about the pediatric patient, we should consider the anatomical difference, physiological difference, and important as well the family issues, because usually the parents are very anxious about their uh, baby or their children. And of course, the common statement, the children or first baby is not a small adult. So you have to consider all these anatomical and physiological differences. So what is the difference between adult in pediatric patient? First, as you see here, the length of the uh, head in comparison with the body is around 25%. In adults, it is 10 to 15% only. So the ratio of the head is high in comparison to the body. That's why we have higher incidence of trauma in pediatric patient. Also, the same mechanism of trauma may cause different injuries. As you can see in adult fracture pelvis, fracture uh, of femur, injury to the knee, maybe fracture tibia. But here the whole body of the child can be injured by the same impact or by the same trauma. Another issue, the ratio between the cranium and the facial bone. The cranium is higher ratio in pediatric patient in comparison with adult the maxillofacial bone is a little bit bigger. That's why, again, another reason the head trauma may be higher in pediatric patients. Because this, the importance of this trauma in pediatric patients for the head, the Centers for Diseases Control and the Prevention in the United States has a report for the American Congress in 2018. And you will understand now why this report was written. Comparison between 2001-2010, it is almost doubled the rate of trauma in patient less than four years. Maybe, the, and this is the visit for ER, maybe the parents are more aware about the dangerous of head trauma, so they are visiting the ER, or maybe the health facility is better. But anyway, the recorded rate is almost doubled in between 2001-2010. The same, there is increase for the young age and adolescents age as well, increase in the rate of ER visits in patients with head trauma. Fortunately, 85% of the head trauma is mild traumatic brain injury, 2% severe and 13% is higher. Despite of that, 15% of this trauma has 61% experience disability after that. So despite moderate and severe head injury or traumatic brain injury is low, but 61% may develop significant disability. Another issue, the symptoms of mild traumatic brain injury like headache or dizziness or thinking and memory problems, modes, emotional changes, sleep difficulties, can persist in 60% of the patient for one month after injury. This may of particular importance if the patient coming for elective or emergency anesthesia and the parent didn't give the history of traumatic brain injury because it is a mild one. And after anesthesia, the patient may have some headache or dizziness and you can't differentiate. It is due to the anesthesia or due to the TPI, which was happened one month before. So it may be one of the issue to take the history of traumatic brain injury from the parents if available. And it is not only a health problem. The child which may have traumatic brain injury has physical impairment, cognitive difficulties, and deficits in behavior. So they may have some change in the education, reduction in the education and socialization as well. It is separate from the children, other children not playing with them. So it is health problem, educational problem, and social problem as well. According to the age group, we have different types of injury. In newborn, they may have birth trauma, so they may have intracranial hemorrhage and cephalic hematoma. In infants start to move, so they have accidental head injury or abuse head trauma. And school children, accidental head injury from too much movement and the playing. In adolescents, they have bicycle, motorcycle, and sports. 
So according to the group of the age, we have different type and different causes of injury. Fractures the skull in pediatric patient is different from the adult. We may have linear fractures, the breast fractures like the adults and the static fractures. You can see the sutures line is away from each other. Basilar fracture is not common in pediatric patients. So linear, depressed fraction and diastatic fractures. Something specific for the neonates, they have what is named the ping pong injury here of the neck, depressed fracture like the ping pong ball. Now, you know, every patient with head trauma or traumatic brain injury, we are using Raskokuma score to assess the level of consciousness and the neurological status. It was modified to the child and infants, but for the eye opening and the best verbal response may be difficult to measure it in infant and the child. So we usually focus in the motor response in the pediatric patient. And also, when we are dealing with pediatric patient in any situation, either traumatic brain injury or any other surgical uh, speciality, you should know the rate, heart rate, respiration, systolic blood pressure, so the vital signs specific to the each age. For example, if you have one month patient, it is heart rate 160, 55 respiration and systolic 70. So this patient is not tachycardiac, not tachypnic, and not hypotensive. So you have to understand which age group you are dealing with to understand which physiological parameter and what is your targets during resuscitation. Also, the, patient, uh, the pediatric patient may have a spinal cord injury without radiological abnormalities, and it can occur in up to 20% in the children less than eight years if they have spinal cord injury. And this level usually cervical, occasionally at the thoracic level. And this because the mobility and elasticity of the spinal cord causing a stretch of the cord. In pediatric patients, the spinal cord can stretch two to three centimeters. In adults, it is only 0.5 centimeters. So they have spinal cord injury easily in, in adults in comparison with the pediatric patient. And it can be explained by unexplained neurological deficits. The patient has cord injury and lower limbs weakness, and you don't know what is the reason. The brain CT is normal or brain MRI is normal, but still some weakness in the lower limb. That's why the MRI of the spine is essential in this situation to diagnose disc rupture or spinal epidural hematoma, cord contusion, or more common hematomelia. This is antra medullary spinal cord hematoma. Fortunately, the diagnosis is good in this situation. And you can see here the mechanism of injury, how the stretch of the spinal cord can happen in the pediatric patients and the presence of intraspinal hematoma, which can be diagnosed by MRI as you can hyper or hypodynistic area in the cervical spinal cord. So this is a syndrome of spinal cord injury without radiological evidence, only with MRI. Now, as you know, any traumatic brain injury you have primary and secondary injury. The primary injury, commonly like adult, extradural, subdural hematoma, traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, patient may have interventricular hemorrhage and they may have obstructive hydrocephalus, intracerebral hemorrhage, contusion, diffuse axonal injury. Generally, the diffuse edema is more common in pediatrics than the adults. But you can see all types of injury can be seen in pediatric and adults. So what is the response for the primary brain injury? We have cerebral hypoperfusion and the cause cerebral ischemia. And with the time, there is increase in, decrease in the energy stores and energy failures. So we have two responses, immediate and the delayed response. The immediate response due to the release of the excitatory amino acids and the release of the oxygen-free radicals, and this leads to necrosis. So the immediate response, necrosis of the cerebral cells. The delayed response due to the mitochondrial and the DNA damage, and this leads to the apoptosis. Both injury can cause brain barrier damage and permanent brain injury. So to summarize, immediate response may cause necrosis, delayed response may cause apoptosis. So 
the injured the disease just to operate it on brain is very liable for secondary injury. Actually, we have a lot of factors which may cause secondary injuries. About 12 factors, 11 started with H and one with S. Hypotension, post-hypoxemia and hyperoxia, hypovolemia, hyperhypoventilation, hyperthermia, acidosis, anemia, increased intercerebral pressure. It can be increased the size of hematoma or increased more hemorrhage, hyponatremia, hyperhypoglycemia, and hyperemia due to the reperfusion. And the last thing is scissor. All this lead to the secondary brain injury. And as you can see, most of them can be manipulated by the anesthesiologist or by the ICU physician. So why it is extremely important to prevent secondary brain injury? If you prevent the secondary brain injury early, so you will prevent necrosis, so you will help in neuroprotection. If you prevent secondary brain injury, you will prevent apoptosis, so you will help in neuro repair. So if you want to remember something from these lectures, the early and prevention, treatment and the prevention of all the 12 factors that I just mentioned now. Another important issue to differentiate between hypotension and hypovolemia. So hypovolemia is one of the causes of hypotension in patient with trauma. If the patient coming with multiple trauma, you may have cyst trauma, cardiac contusion, hemopericardium, tension pneumothorax, spinal cord shock, and in severe brain injury, you may have neurogenic stand myocardium. Maybe it is not common in pediatric patient, but it still can happen if herniation okay. See, this very short note about the neurogenic stand myocardium, you have acute brain injury causing severe sympathetic stimulation, so in too much increase in the systemic vascular resistance, neurogenic stand myocardium, so you have cardiogenic shock, arrhythmia, reduction in the cerebral perfusion pressure, and the neuroinflammation, or we lead to the secondary brain injury. So it is low possibility in pediatric patient may occur due to the sudden increase in the intracranial pressure, usually presented with hemodynamic instability. And the important point why I mentioned it here, the patient is hypotensive, but is not hypovolemic. So you may think this patient is hypovolemic, you give more fluids, so you are worsening the myocardial functions more by more fluids because of the hypotension. It is diagnosis by exclusion from the other factors, just I mentioned it in the previous slide. So how to manage a pediatric patient with TBI? We have this actual patient, three years old girl, 13.5 kilo, full of heavy object over her head, then she fell back in her back. So it is double trauma. One from the heavy object and her head stuck to the hard ground. She came with bleeding from nose, wound from the face and the left black eye, moving the four limbs. In ER, she vomited once, and she has grasscocoma scale between 11 to 12. And this here X-ray, you can see the extradural hematoma. It is almost two extradural hematoma, and we have world signs. This is bleeding inside the hematoma. It is like some fluid level inside the uh, extradural hematoma. This is actually a bad sign because active bleeding is still there and increasing the size of hematoma, increasing the pressure on the brain, increasing the ICB reduction in the cerebral perfusion pressure. So she came for OR, monitored, not intubated yet. She has two peripheral cannula 22 and the saline infusion. Grascocoma scale decreased in OR to eight. Pupils were equal but sluggish and you need to manage this patient. You have to start anesthesia and the total perioperative management. What we should do in this patient, we will discuss it in some details. And these details, according to the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines, which was published in 2019 and divided into three main items, monitoring, threshold for the intercranial pressure and the cerebral perfusion pressure and the treatment. You have some medical therapy and other uh, uh, medical intervention. So according to these three main items, I will discuss the management of this three years old girl. Of course, 
any resuscitation, A, B, C, D, E. So you will start to intubate the patient and to secure the airway. Who should intubate the pediatric patient? We have very nice statement from Christine from San Diego in California. If the anesthesiologist manage less than 100 pediatric cases per year, it will he will have five times more likely to experience complication than the is dealing with more than 200 cases per year. So if you are dealing or handling 100 pediatric patient only, you have five times more likely to some complication, difficult to ventilate, difficult to intubate according to the situation. Between 100 and 200 may be three times likely to have some difficulty. In short, one anesthesiologist with good uh, experience in pediatric anesthesia. Of course, intubation is not easy in patient with trauma or traumatic brain injury. The patient, like our patient, has maybe risk of vomiting aspiration, urgency, maybe you don't have good equipment, good experience, increase in ICB and reduction in the cerebral perfusion pressure during the intubation. Of course, if the patient has suspected C-spines, you should do manual inline stabilization and respiratory compromise, the patient may have chest trauma or may be aspirate. So even if you are trying to pre-oxygenate, the patient will not benefit from pre-oxygenation because of aspiration of pneumothorax or hemothorax or tension pneumothorax. Any other comorbidities, the patient may have cardiovascular compromise, may be hemorrhagic shock, and any abnormal anatomy may be facial trauma or the patient has abnormal anatomy before. So anyway, it is very challenging to intubate the patient with trauma, especially traumatic brain injury. You intubated the patient and you want to ventilate now. How to ventilate the patient with acute brain injury, either trauma or non-trauma? We have these recent guidelines from uh, the European Society of Intensive Care and three main questions. Target BAO2, target BACO2, and to apply BEEP or no. And we'll answer this. Both hypoxemia and hyperoxia should be avoided. So you have to maintain the patient either with or without high ICB to maintain BO2 between 80 to 120. CO2, keep it normal from 35 to 40. Short-term ventilation only recommended in impending herniation. Even if the patient has ICB, it is not recommended. There is no recommendation, no evidence. It is only recommended in these new guidelines in patients with impending herniation. But as a therapeutic option for high ICB, it is, there is no evidence. You may do it, but it's not recommended and we don't have evidence for that. So another big question, can I apply BEEP in patient with traumatic brain injury? We have two categories, patient with normal ICB and high ICB. Of course, with normal ICB and no respiratory distress syndrome, you can ventilate as usual, apply B5 to 10 according to the situation. If normal ICB with ARDIS, you have protective ventilation and you need to apply high B to overcome the inflammatory changes which occur in the respiratory distress syndrome in the lung. The challenging point is the high ICB. If there is no ARDS, and the beep insensitive. Beep insensitive means that the ICB is not affected by beep. You apply it five, seven, eight, ten beep, ICB is not, not a change. It is almost the same. So this is, means beep insensitive high ICB. So you are going to ventilate abnormal. Now come to the big challenges. Patient high ICB aspirated or he developed other respiratory distress syndrome. No recommendations. So, but I think you should follow the protective ventilation and you may focus on the reduction of the ICB because ICB control may be a little bit easier to control than the respiratory distress syndrome. And when you are controlling the ICB, it may be changed to the PEEP insensitive and you can apply a little bit higher PEEP. In, in short, there is no recommendation from these new European guidelines. The other point, hemodynamic support, what is the fluid, when to give blood, which vasopressors. Actually, the main issue to main or main goal for hemodynamic support 
to improve and to maintain cerebral blood flow and uh, cerebral perfusion pressure. With any acute brain injury, we have ischemic core. Actually, this is a deep tissue. Nothing can be done. And around this core, the area of binomera, or this is the area of shadow, low flow, and this is our target because you need to improve the oxygenation, improve the perfusion to this area. And the last area is normal flow. Actually, it is very difficult to maintain cerebral blood flow, especially with impaired autoregulation and hemodynamic instability. But this is your job to maintain good perfusion to the penumbra area or area with low flow or shadow area. So children has less autoregulatory reserve. That means you need to focus more on this area to improve the perfusions. So this is the area of ischemic area, dead tissues, and surrounded by binomera or the area with low flow. It is recommended that for patients, for pediatric patients, two years to keep the CPP around 45, between two to eight, at around 57 millimeter mercury, more than eight, it is very close to the other 68 millimeter mercury. So this is your target in this three age group, two years, two to eight, more than eight, 45, 57, and 68. Now, as I mentioned, the patient came with two peripheral cannula. It is enough, should you insert arterial line and central line before starting the anesthesia? Of course, this is emergency and the life-saving procedures. You don't have good time. If you can insert or insert it before, okay, no problem. But is two peripheral cannula 22 is enough? Actually, it is enough. Time to infuse one liter of normal saline under normal circumstances is around 22 minutes. That means you can infuse around 45 ml of normal saline per minute in patient with 22 cannula. So two cannula, you can infuse 90 ml of normal saline over one minute in, tw in two 22 cannulas. If you are need blood, the rate of course is less, maybe 20, 25, but again, you, this is more is enough for this pediatric patient with uh, 13.5 kilo. So initial fluid management will be saline 0.9 and your target to keep your output more than one ml per hour. And be careful from the sodium level because as I mentioned, hyponatremia cause secondary brain injury. In very young pediatric patient, you may need to give dextrose 5% to avoid hypoglycemia, which may cause secondary brain injury as well and no tight control. Give maintains the glucose between eight to 10, if needed, use insulin. Again, the, be careful from the high volume of saline 0.9 or hypertonic saline. Here, the mortality in relation to the serum level of chloride. Normal is around 96 to 106. So in this situation, the mortality is 26% in patient with moderately severe traumatic brain injury. But if it is increased to 110, 115, the mortality increased to 42, then to 58, 85, and 94% if more than 1 to 5. So in short, be careful from high volume saline and hypertonic saline, and you should monitor both sodium and chloride frequently to avoid this higher mortality rate. Is albumin safe with traumatic brain injury? This was a big question before when the uh, saline versus safe study was uh, published uh, maybe 15 years ago. And the saline or albumin for fluid resuscitation in traumatic brain injury, this is subgroup analysis of the safe study. And they found that when comparing saline with albumin after one month or after two years, the survival rate is higher in saline than albumin. So the conclusion of this study, saline is better than albumin in resuscitation of acute traumatic brain injury. So you may ask why the mortality is higher with albumin. Actually, a big defect in this study, they used albumin 4%, which is hypotonic. It is 260 milliosmol only in comparison with the normal osmolality of the plasma, 290. So if you use albumin 5% or 20%, you will not have these figures. 
And actually, albumin B beneficial in traumatic brain injury. It improves the microcirculations, improves the brain edema, and reduces the transcapillary leak. And it was found the patient with low serum albumin is an dependent predictors of poor outcome after TBI. So it, you may use, there is no good evidence or good guidelines or recommendations, but some of the reference may use albumin 5%, 5 to 10 ml per kg, if the patient needs high volume of crystalloids. So to avoid the high volume of crystalloids, we may use albumin 5%, 5 to 10 ml per kg. Now we have another big question. As you see in our patient, almost two extradural hematoma with high incidence or high possibility of intraoperative bleeding. So your patient now is normal volemic, but you are expecting bleeding. Can you preload it? Actually, no, this is not a good practice. Acute hypervolemia impairs the autoregulation, which is already impaired by the trauma, damage the endothelial glycocalyx, and increase leukocytic and the platelet adhesions to the vascular wall, increases the inflammatory process and increase the tissue edema. So there is no role for acute hypervolemia in the anesthetic practice, either in TBR or non-TBI. Actually, you should avoid fluid overloads. Fluid overloads has a lot of the systemic effect, respiratory, hepatic, GIT, abdominal wall may increase the intra-abdominal pressure, renal, cardiovascular, and the CNS as well. This is the side effects of over fluid overloads and CNS. Increase edema, impaired cognition, delirium, increase ICP and reduction in the cerebral perfusion pressure, may increase the intraocular pressures and may increase the size of hematoma. So normovolemia all the time is, is our target. And you can see here in pediatric patient with severe traumatic brain injury and has fluid overload, Mortality here is 10%, um, here is 18%. Length of the stay and the ventilator is almost the same. And the acute kidney injury is higher in patient with fluid overload. So again, in short, avoid fluid overload because it may increase the mortality and increase the uh, acute kidney injury. Now, blood transfusion. So what is your policy? What is your target hemoglobin? Is seven to eight is safe in this group or no? This is the autoregulation in normal brain. If you have drop in hemoglobin from 14 down to six to seven, we oxygen delivery is maintained due to the dilatation of the cerebral vessels. So from down 14 down to seven or eight, you have maintained oxygen delivery because of the brain vessels diameter dilatation. But at a point, when hemoglobin drops to seven, you have anaerobic metabolism and acidosis and significant drop in the oxygen delivery, despite the cerebral perfusion flow is still high because of dilatation. But the, because of anemia, you have significant reduction in the oxygen delivery. This is in normal brain. In injured brain, you have shift of the curve to the right. So the critical point may occur at eight or nine. So conservative blood management in acute resuscitation of patient with traumatic brain injury, no role for this conservative policy. You have to maintain hemoglobin nine or 10 at least. In the previous lectures by Professor Massimo, he mentioned that the stroke higher incidence if hemoglobin less than 12. So in short, general statement, you have a brain just before the trauma, hemoglobin is 12 or 13 and it's very nice. Now this brain suffering from trauma, brain edema, from hematoma, from contusion, from high ICB reduction, CBP, and you ask the brain to adapt himself with hemoglobin seven or eight. Completely unlogic. So another problem, this phenomenal area is suffering in silence. If the expression is good, suffers in silence, that means you are not measuring the changes unless with cerebral microdiuresis. Increased metabolism, acidosis, increased lactate pyruvate ratio, that means anaerobic metabolism, hypoglycemia, and hyperthermia. 
If you add anemia to all these changes, of course, you will have significantly, 100% you will have secondary brain injury. Okay, so that's why maintain hemoglobin 9, 10, or even more during acute resuscitation. So hypoxic monomera area in severe traumatic brain injury present a population susceptible for anemia and hypovolemia. And you can't apply some conclusion from general ICU to a patient with severe traumatic brain injury. Another problem with anemia, impaired autoregulation and adverse neurological outcome and vasoplegia. That means the patient is hypotensive. You start to give nine efferin or not every infusion, the patient is not responding, is still hypotensive because the anemia causing vasoplegia. So the answer of anemia and the blood transfusion, I hope it is clear. Vasoactive drugs, now the patient is hypotensive despite you give enough fluids and you may even give blood transfusion. So which vasopressor, phenyl efferin, nor epi, dopamine, adrenaline, which one is okay? In this study 10 years ago, they found that it is best to maintain the CPP with no adrenaline. So it is recommended from this study, about this 10 years ago. Two recent study, but it was used to improve the CPP, specifically in hypotensive patients. And the other one, also another systemic review for augmentation of CPP with uh, vasopressors. The first one, they didn't find any vasopressor over other. You can use which any one. Here, it is almost the same, but not maybe a little bit is better in maintaining CPP. So one study, the old study 10 years ago, norebi recommended, and the other new two studies, nothing. But why I like norebi? As you know, norebi have a strong alpha effect and weak beta effect. And because of the increase after load, uh, we have what is named an Arib effect. An Arib effect means if the give norebi, and there is increase in the systemic vascular resistance within 10 to 15 minutes, you have increase in the cardiac output. It can be present with phenyl efferin, but this is more significant because the beta stimulation of the norebi, weak beta stimulation. So in short, norebi has a, an Arib effect, increased systemic vascular resistance, increased cardiac output. So now you I, I can hear everybody asking now, can I infuse nor EBI in peripheral line? What do you think? Yes, you can. You can infuse nor EBI in peripheral with intraoperative through a peripheral IV caster. What is the evidence for that? Actually, this was editorial comment on this study, which was done in Netherlands. They using more than 14,000 patients and extravasations occur in five patients only. And in these five patients, there is no need for any medical or surgical intervention. And the recommended concentration, 20 mic per ml, that's used one milligram of nor -EB in 50 ml of normal saline. So you can use nor -EB in peripheral cannula, 20 mic per ml. And of course, it is better to keep the vein under your eye to see if any extra position. Now, one of the, I'm coming to the end. I know it is too much. Hyperosmolar therapy, manitol or hypertonic saline. Manitol, there is no good evidence, not good study to recommend. So from the uh, Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines to use, if ICP is more than 20, you can use hypertonic saline, two to five ml over 10 to 20 minutes. Some textbook or some Reference may mention ICP more than 15, especially in infant, very young age, because the compliance is less. And some reference may ask 20 mil, more than 20 for 10 to 20 minutes. But actually, I think just the ICP is more than 20, whatever the duration, you don't know what will happen after that. So you can give the uh, hypertonic saline. And it can be used of, for fusion after that. And be careful as well from the high bar coloring. Uh, guidelines for cerebral edema, we suggest hypertonic over manitol. This is another evidence. And also in adults, pediatric and adults. 
Manitol is effective alternative if you don't have hypertonic saline or the patient has high chloride serum uh, level. And it is recommended for Manitol to give the polus over short time, not infusion over long time. And there is some another uh, recommendation. Don't use it before pre-hospital transfer uh, or prophylactic in patients with TBI because there is a lot of complications. The most recent study for hypertonic uh, uh, saline versus manitol published this month. Again, these uh, randomized control trials, 12 studies and 406, 446 patients. Most of the study suggest or give good evidence to use hypertonic saline, not manitol. Another technical point, some pediatric patient, it may be difficult IV access during admission in ER. So you can use intraosseous hypertonic saline 3% and it, you can have a good rise in the serum sodium by intraosseous access. Adverse effects that I mentioned, rebound increase in ICB, hypernatremia and hyperosmolality, hyperchloramic acidosis, which may worse the bleeding as well, phlebitis, DVT, and coagulopathy. Coagulopathy and TPI. Is the patient with TBI as higher risk of coagulopathy? Actually, yes. From these uh, review articles, nearly two thirds of the patient with severe TBI has some abnormal coagulation. Abnormal coagulation test means, for example, INR is 1.2. This is considered coagulopathy in the, in the study. Actually, the patient may have hypocoagulability state early and they may have hypercoagulability state after that, which increases this thrombotic tendency. So both of them are present, hypo or hypercoagulability in pediatric in, in uh, patient with TBI. The mechanism actually due to the uh, blood-brain disruption and hypoperfusion, stress and the micro rupture of microvessels, endocellular activation, release of tissue factor, inflammatory mediators, and during resuscitation, you may have hemodilution, acidosis, and hypothermia. Again, hemodilution, this low hemoglobin and anemia is a risk factor of coagulopathy. And anyway, the end result, you may have hypercoagulation and microthrombosis or consumption of the coagulation factors and the platelets, you have DIC. So if you have this problem, you have progress of the new hemorrhagic contusion. It was small here, but it is increased in size. And of course, it will increase the ICB and reduce the perfusion pressure. Can I use serenexamic acid to minimize the risk of breathing or to reduce the size of hematoma? Actually, no. No effect in mortality or disability, and it may reduce the expansion of hematoma. So there is no good rule of tranexamic acid in TBI. So how can I use, how to treat the coagulopathy in traumatic brain injury? Actually, we don't have currently some guidelines. You will follow the same as the patient has systemic trauma or belly trauma, you will follow the same. But in systemic trauma without traumatic brain injury, we may have permissive hypotension or hypotensive resuscitation. This is not in, applied in TPI patient. Keep the mean pressures around 70 or 80. And all the time, the platelet should be more than 100 uh, per thousand, 100,000. OK? So no guidelines. Follow the systemic trauma guidelines. Keep MAP 70 to 80 and the platelet more than 100. Be ready for the compressive craniectomy, the, it, which may be therapeutic. The neurosurgeon decide to do it before the surgery because neurological deterioration or herniation or the patient was in ICU not responding for the medical treatment, intracranial refractory hypertension. Or during the surgery, they found the brain is very edematous, very difficult to apply the bone flap and expected to have more swelling of the brain. So they will leave the bone flap and keep the patient decompressive cranial. Usually this patient is more critical, low glasgocoma scale, more need for uh, blood, more need for fluids because of the fluid shift. That's why I told it is, should be ready for this patient. It is, you are dealing with very critical patients. The last point in my lectures, you should use scissor prophylaxis, especially in patient with uh, these risk factors, contusion, severity of injury, depressed fractures, penetrating injury, 
extra subdural hematoma, and the most commonly we are using levothyristam or phenytoin. And the most recent study to compare the levothyristam and the uh, phenytoin, you know, they found 37% occurrence of scissor in the levothyristam uh, group and 41 in phenytoin. So maybe levothyristam is better in this situation. So in conclusions, just I mentioned before, if you want to remember something from this lecture, just early treatment and the preventions of all these factors, which can be manipulated by the anesthesiologist or by the ICU physicians. And this, as you can see, some cardiovascular, some metabolic and some respiratory factors. And thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zaghloud, for this very comprehensive, really comprehensive lecture. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Zaghloud, are you getting me? Yeah. Yeah. Just would like to thank you for this very comprehensive lecture. Uh, I have... I I have one question, uh, just as a, as a tricky question. What about, you said you have a patient with a high intracranial pressure and we have the same patient is complaining of the ARDS. You said yes. according to the European ICU doctors, they, don't, they have no recommendations. Can you give us your experience, please? Yeah. What do you do? I told it in short during I mentioned. You have two major issues, high ICP and the patient is ARDS and it's difficult to ventilate. Okay. Yes. Difficult to ventilate, usually you need to use higher level of beep to can oxygenate the patient well because hypoxemia will cause injury to the brain. So more easier to reduce the ICP as you can. Either you are using manitol hypertonic saline or decompression to can ventilate. Actually, it's very challenging. Some patient is very difficult to do something. You are applying all your measures to reduce ICB, all the measures to ventilate the patient. And usually this patient has poor prognosis. Okay. Uh, another, I have a, another question here. What about Hartman solution and fluid resuscitation? Actually, yeah. The, uh, I mentioned according to the Brain Trauma Foundation, it started with normal saline. But if you are monitoring chloride, sodium, osmolality regular, you can start with ringer lactate. So both ringer lactate, a little bit hypoosmolar. Maybe some persons recommend plasma lights, but plasma light is expensive and not available in most of the hospital. So the standard to start with normal saline, and if the patient starts the chloride to increase, change it to ringer lactate. Nice. Um, Another question is, what's the best IV fluid for TBI? Well, this, uh, I think this is the answer there. You start with normal. Yes, yes, is, yes. We are, you did answer it actually. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, this is all the questions I got. If you have a final recommendation, it was very clear actually, very clear and very nice up to me. If any, if you have another anything to talk, tell us more, and would be great. Uh, actually, there is a question from Facebook. Uh, what is the criteria of the IV line to infuse epinephrine, please? Criteria. Okay, what is the diameter? What is the gain to the cannula? I didn't hear well. Criteria of what? Yeah. IV. What is the criteria of the cannula, of the IV cannula? Ah, yeah. My, this my, I mentioned it in, in details, all right? So if you are able to use these two cannulas to infuse the fluids and the blood, it is okay. If you have a good time and the condition of the patient allow it to put a central line or arterial line, it depends on only in one thing, the urgency of this craniotomy. If the patient can wait for 10, 15 minutes, you can do it. And you should have good experience in, uh, in, in pediatric patient for central line and arterial line. Don't lose the time and miss the time in putting the clients and the patient ICB is increasing with the time. Uh, 
So it depends in one factors only, the urgency of craniotomy. Okay, there's another question. I think you are, what if patient with brain injury has hypernatremia? What to do with them? The hypernatremia you mean? Yes, the, the, they had a patient with a brain injury and already have, he's having hypernatremia. What fluid do you do you use then? This is the question, one question of the audience. But yeah, but this is why that I, I mentioned the differentiation. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah. And you should differentiate the causes of hypotension and exclude the non-hemorrhagic causes. So exactly. hemorrhagic causes, you don't need a lot of fluids, all right? And uh, but if the patient needs volume, of course you will give a volume. If the patient needs blood, you will give a blood. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, I think there is a, an interesting question here. Uh, can we use the polarizing muscle relaxant in TPI? Yeah, muscle relaxant is used, of course, for uh, intubation, and there is new recommendation in patients with respiratory stress syndrome. You have to give muscle relaxant for easy ventilation of the patient. So there is no contraindications in the early stages to stabilize your patient. After that, you can stop it. But in early management and respiratory stress syndrome, you should give muscle relaxant. No, he he is asking but, but particularly about depolarizing muscle relaxant, saxamisonium, for example. Ah, saxamisonium, yeah. Actually, the statement, golden statements in all textbook, if you are query about some problem, it is minimal increase in the ICP and it is transient. Okay, so if you are query about difficult intubation and you want to secure the airway, keep the priority for the airway. But if you are sure you can intubate with the cronium, go ahead for the cronium. In short, temporary increase in ICB with saxamisonium, and this will be for a few minutes, and don't hesitate to use it if you are query about difficulty in airway. I answered the question. Yeah, yeah, very good. Okay. Is that all the questions, um, uh, Dr. Chamandi? Yes, that's all that I got here. Okay. So uh, we come to the end of this lecture tonight. So I would like to thank all the speakers and the panelists. And for uh, Prof. Lambert, uh, you have promised us um, for a recent or for uh, an upcoming uh, lecture soon. So we just uh, want to confirm that from your side. Uh, sure. Question now. I want to give some comment regarding the manitol. How long to use manitol? Maybe I didn't mention during the lectures. It is there is a recommendation about regular use of manitol. If you want to use it just for one dose in high ICB, don't keep the patient on regular manitol every six hours of eight hours. This is an old trend, not recommended now. Okay, because the high risk of rebound increase in the ICB. And if you want to use it, infuse it a very short time, three minutes, five minutes. Don't give it over longer time because bolus is more affecting than infusion. This is a question I just saw it now. Thank you very much, Dr. Zalul. That was Hello, great. Thank you. Hello, finished. Uh, <laughs> uh, Prof. Lamberti, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Fauzi Khan, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Sahil, uh, thank you very much. I just want to get the promise from uh, Prof. Lamberti about the next uh, lecture soon. Thank you. Thank you. For sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.